Be, 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 uh, cohomology for, for UN gauge theories induced by finite spectral triples. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. And first of all, I really would like to thank the organizer of this Congress for giving me the opportunity of being here and uh, participating to this really nice event. And actually I want to thank all of you for being here online and uh, in-person participants. It's actually really nice to speak to faces and people. So in uh, this uh, uh, presentation, I would like to report uh, on some recent uh, progress that I made in this um, field and in, with the goal of trying to describe the battle in Vyakovsky formalism within the setting of non-commutative geometry. So uh, just to give you an idea, um, the plan of this talk is the following. So if the slides will help me. Okay, so the first part will be devoted to tell you something about the battle in Milkovisky construction. So I will start uh, telling you what is the motivation and where this uh, construction was first discovered. And uh, that will be actually the setting of uh, um, path integral quantization for gauge theories. Uh, then I will tell you something about what is the key step in the, uh, this uh, formalism, namely the introduction of the so-called ghost fields, so how to construct a BV extension. And then I will introduce these two cohomological theories, the BRST and the BV cohomology. So that will be the part about uh, this button and Wilkowski formalism. Then there will be a second, actually super quick part, because Walter already told you everything about a non-commutative geometry, and namely try to convince you why non-commutative geometry can be an interesting mathematical setting for trying to describe the BV formalism. So, uh, um, and I, actually I will just, uh, you know, uh, tell you how to construct a gauge theory from a spectral triple, just what is needed. Uh, and uh, the rest will be uh, told you by Walter again. And uh, then the third part will be, uh, can we put these two things together? So can we describe the BV construction using the language of a spectral triple? And for this part, I will tell you what I mean, what is for me the notion of a BV spectral triple, why that can be interesting to study, what is a total spectral triple, and finally, how both this cohomological theory, the BRST and the BV, can be described in terms of a cohomological theory, the natural fields for spectral triples. So that would be uh, the last part, but for now, let me introduce what is going to be the main character in this talk. So for me, uh, what I will denote as a pair X0, S0 is what I would call a theory, let's say a physical theory, where X0 is the field configuration space and S0 is an action functional defined over X0 with, with values in R. So if at the top of that, we also consider a gauge group acting on the configuration space, we say that this pair, so X0 is zero is a gauge theory, if we do have that the action functional is zero, it stays invariant in the action of the group. So somehow this definition is really, let's say, reducing to the essence what is a, a gauge theory. So I'm not telling you what is the structure that I'm going to put on this object, but this will be uh, said more clearly uh, later on. For now, let me be a little bit vague when I'm actually introducing the BV formalism and actually the motivation be behind that. So the context is the context of quantization of gauge theory via the path integral approach. So when we try to quantize a uh, theory uh, via this uh, approach, we ended up having to compute integrals of the, the type uh, I wrote over there. And uh, of course, the reason why I put uh, the measure in red and in bracket is that most of the time, this is of course not well defined. So uh, a standard procedure to face this problem is actually to go perturbative. And uh, so I just uh, here recall how it works a little bit. And so the idea is that we go from having to compute uh, an integral that is actually, you know, with all its problems uh, to uh, considering a sum, a sum of a quantity that is written in terms of Feynman diagrams, where the key point is actually that we are indeed considering a sum taken over the critical locus of the action functional. And uh, it's actually this um, point where uh, um, considering a gauge theory enters uh, and plays a role. Because of course, uh, in order to have that everything is, it, it works, uh, we need to consider isolated and regular critical points for the action functionals, which is not the condition satisfied when we consider a gauge theory. Because of course, in that point, critical points of uh, the action is zero appears to be in orbit. So this is why uh, the, Quantization of a gauge tier via path integral approach is definitely not a straightforward procedure. 
So then one might wonder, okay, so how can we somehow uh, eliminate these redundant symmetries without changing uh, the theory we are actually uh, considering? So the underlying physical theory. So one might actually first consider the idea of uh, somehow quotienting with respect to, to the action of group. So somehow uh, identify what from a physical point of view are two equivalent points and just uh, uh, consider that object. But often this is not the, um, let's say mathematically easy way of uh, proceeding. And here is where uh, this is, um, uh, notion of ghost fields appear. So somehow the idea is that we are going orthogonally. So instead of, uh, let's say, quotienting, we are trying to solve our problem by adding new variables that goes under the name of uh, uh, ghost fields. So here I just define what is a ghost field, but it's nothing, uh, I mean, particular is just, as I said, an auxiliary graded variable. And uh, uh, I'm just introducing what is the, the usual notation. So uh, ghost field is uh, something that is just characterized by a degree. So it's an integer degree and a parity, which is either zero or one. And we do have a, a parity zero when actually our field is a real bosonic field and parity one for um, Grassmannian field. Okay, so a little bit of history. Of course, so the first one who introduced the concept of uh, ghost fields were founded on top of when they were studying uh, how to apply this perturbative path integral to the young mill theory. And what they suggested was indeed to try to eliminate the divergence appearing in the integral by introducing these extra non-physical particles that after them uh, ended up being called the uh, favored pop of uh, ghost fields. So uh, again, so the main point is that actually we are introducing these uh, new particles and uh, the key point of this uh, BV construction will be really this passage from our initial theory X0, S0 to an extended one where this goes play a role. So that was the beginning of the story. Of course, uh, other um, steps were taken and uh, San Justin and then Batalyn Wilkowski ended up uh, reaching a lot of these uh, constructions. So not only introducing, let's say first level ghost, but also ghost of higher degree, as well as anti-ghost. And then of course, uh, arriving to have like an anti-bracket structure on the space of all these extra particles. So let me say exactly what is an anti-ghost field. So an anti-ghost is uh, defined starting from a ghost field. So it's uh, so just characterized by, again, the ghost degree and the parity. And uh, the ghost degree of an anti-field is given in terms of the ghost degree of the corresponding field. So is the ghost degree of the anti-field that I denoted with phi star is minus the ghost degree of the field minus one. And uh, I mean, remember that minus one, so there is an extra shift in somehow. And for what concerns the parity, the parity of the anti-ghost is going to be the opposite of the parity of the ghost. So somehow we, there is this, let's say, doubling. But let's uh, try to be a little bit more precise and describe you exactly what is this key step in the uh, batalin wilkowski formalism, so this extension procedure. And I will tell you how this works in the set, uh, uh, in the case I'm interested in, so for finite dimensional. Uh, gauge theories. So precisely now I'm telling you what is the mathematical structure I'm considering on my pair. So X0 is going to be just an affine uh, real space. Uh, S0 is going to be a regular function, uh, an element in the uh, structure uh, ring of uh, our variety. And uh, for the gauge theory, we'll be considering our UN theory. And what I want to be able to associate that is a new pair uh, denoted with X tilde, S tilde. So for what uh, concern X tilde, this is going to be a C-graded super vector space, uh, suitable to be decomposed as a direct sum of F plus F star one, where F is a graded local free module with a homogeneous component that are finite dimensional. So uh, what do I mean exactly? So this condition is uh, taking into account the fact that uh, we want to have this doubling. So I told you ghost on one side, anti-ghost on the other side. So this F accounts for the ghost sector of your theory. And then uh, uh, F star shifted, remember the shifted, is uh, the anti-ghost part. And uh, indeed what characterizes this formalism is really this doubling. So for each ghost, you want to have also the corresponding anti-ghost. Another condition on X tilde is that uh, what we are doing in degree, so we are not actually doing anything in degree zero. So we want to keep our real fields 
there. So what we are acting only on pos strictly positive and strictly neg negative degrees. So we want to be able to recover what is physically relevant and not just auxiliary elements. And uh, uh, then for what concerned the uh, uh, action is still there. So uh, of course it's going to be a regular uh, function on everything. So fields, uh, ghost fields, anti-ghost fields. And once again, so if we do restrict it to the real world, so if we do restrict it to x0, should be what we started with. But the key condition is uh, this one. So we are actually asking that I still solve the classical master equation. So that if we take the Poisson bracket of a silde with itself, this should be zero. Where this uh, bracket is just coming from uh, the pairing of, uh, so saying that it's not zero each time it, we have a, a pairing of a ghost with the corresponding anti-ghost, and then you extend it on the old algebra. So why this uh, condition is actually crucial? Because it's what allows us to define a BV complex. So each time we're given a, a BV extended theory, we can construct a, a BV a cohomology complex. So here is uh, uh, the definition. So for uh, the cochain spaces, we have that the cochain in degree i are the um, part of degree i of the symmetric algebra generated by this graded uh, vector space. And the co-boundary operator is defined in terms of uh, S tilde. So you see is taken, is defined to be like taking the Poisson bracket with uh, S tilde and your element. And what assure that this is actually a co-boundary operator is precisely the condition that uh, um, S tilde is a solution of the classical master equation. So uh, then up to now, for what I told you, we can see these three steps. So we start with our gauge theory, we construct the extended one, and then the cohomology induced by our BV extended theory. So uh, somehow this is important because we could say that the battle in Wilkowski formalism can be viewed as a cohomological approach to treat gauge symmetries. Indeed, uh, if we do compute these uh, cohomology groups, we've realized that they actually capture important physical information on the initial theory we were trying to study. So this X zero, S zero. So for example, in the zero degree, you actually ended up collecting the classical observable of your theory. So of course, one uh, now is uh, interesting to know how to make this uh, kind of extension. So how we can determine how many and which kind of ghost anti-ghost fields we have to introduce and how to construct a corresponding action functional. And this answer, uh, the answer are the following. So for determining what is the ghost sector, what you have to do is uh, co to compute a consultate resolution of the Jacobian ideal. And I will say a few words in a second for that. And for what concern uh, co construction this, uh, constructing this extended uh, action functional, you have some kind of approximation procedure. And so here I'm just uh, uh, citing uh, some people that have been working in uh, exactly this setting of finite dimensional uh, theories. The first group more from, let's say, a physical perspective, and the second more from a mathematical one. Okay, so in any case, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize is that this uh, construction somehow is going to um, look at what are the symmetry of your group. So how, you know, so which kind of ghosts you have to introduce, how the action is going to be, they're really related to the kind of symmetries you have in your initial S0. Okay, so uh, now just quickly to give you the flavor of what kind of uh, uh, construction you have to perform. So um, this consultate resolution. So uh, you want to determine what is the ghost sector of your theory, but actually what you ended up the, uh, most of the time doing literature is to construct the other part, but you know, they're symmetric, so it's not terrible. So how to construct F tilde shifted. So the idea is that you have to compute uh, this uh, consultate resolution of the Jacobian ideal, namely the ideal generated by the partial derivative of your action functional. And what you do is uh, an iterated procedure. So step by step, you're going to introduce new variables. So you're, in this case, anti-ghost uh, with alternative parity. Uh, so depending on which degree you are and decreasing degree. Uh, with the goal of constructing, as I said, a free resolution of this uh, differential algebra. So namely, you want to construct a uh, um, complex uh, with, that satisfies these conditions, so such that the uh, sequence is exact. So what you ended up working on with is something that looks like that. 
So uh, just one uh, small remark, what happens in degree minus one? So remember that uh, uh, what really characterizes this BV formalism is this uh, duality between ghosts on one side and anti-ghosts on the other side. So of course, what happens in degree minus one is actually determined by what happens in degree zero. So somehow what uh, is in degree minus one is fixed already. So the job start by uh, looking how to solve the situation in degree minus two. So somehow intuitively you have that indeed the degree minus one, we have just introduced all the anti-fields corresponding to the initial physical field of your theory, but in degree minus two is where you actually start analyzing the structure of your action functionals, because what you do is to introduce how many generators as uh, how many are the independent linear relations between the partial derivative of your action functional. So I will tell you what's the answer for the kind of model I'm interested in. So actually, um, what was uh, important for the following construction it was to find a finite Gauss sector for this theory. So that was, uh, um, I mean, uh, it, it was, uh, let's say, a nice result because often in this kind of structure, you ended up having infinite uh, Gauss fields. But anyhow, so as you can see, um, the uh, W that really represents your Gauss sector is just given by a finite uh, family. So in degree minus two, sorry, in degree uh, one, you ended up having um, as many Gauss fields as uh, is uh, this uh, binomial coefficient. And this is also what it's telling you that at a certain point you will finish the construction. Uh, but um, let's try to explain why this, uh, uh, this uh, ghost field, some of the ghost sector somehow encodes the symmetry of the action. So let's uh, consider the, this example. So where we are taking an action functional that is actually um, a, fu a function of the second Casimir of UN. And of course, this is uh, invariant and a joint action of uh, UN. And uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, this, what I denoted by uh, CIJ, so these uh, ghosts in degree one, are capturing the fact that you do have symmetries between pairs of variables in your action as zero. While for uh, what happens in degree two, so these ghosts E, I, J, K are actually counting, you know, relations between triples of variables. And also this is what tells you, okay, of course it makes sense at a certain point it will finish, so in degree n square minus one. So uh, with this kind of action is uh, quite intuitive, realizing that this is uh, the Gauss sector, but uh, I, I mean, I can tell you that you can also consider more general actions and this is still, uh, the solution and still the, the ghost sector you're interested in. Of course, uh, then uh, one has to, to construct also the extended action. So um, I wrote here how it works, but uh, the only thing uh, um, I will uh, in a second draw you the attention on what are the important parts. But for this bit, I should say that it works for this specific class of uh, action. So it determine a solution of a classical master equation in the co uh, completely generality. It was actually and still to do. But for this class of action, it works. And the properties of the steel day is that it's linear in the anti fields, anti ghost fields, quadratic in the ghost fields, and is an exact finite solution of the classical master equation. And these three properties are actually important. So, no spoiler for the uh, remaining of this talk, but try to remember. So, linear in the anti fields, anti ghost fields, and quadratic in the ghost. So, this will play a key role. Okay, so now you know what's your pair. So we figured out what is X tilde, S tilde. And as uh, we already know, each time you are given an extended theory, you can construct the corresponding BV complex. So the first three steps of the story. So unfortunately, often this is not uh, the final uh, goal. So you might actually uh, be in uh, situations where you have to uh, somehow eliminate the anti-fields and the anti-ghost fields in your story, which implies that you want to perform a gauge fixing procedure. So unfortunately uh, for how it's the situation right now, we cannot uh, uh, do that uh, straightforwardly. So what we have to do is to introduce auxiliary fields. So if you do remember how we ended up constructing this extended X tilde, so there were ghosts on one side, anti-ghost on the other side. And for how the construction works, actually all the ghosts were in positive degree. So this is why we need this intermediate step, but it's a little bit technical just to tell you that, you know, 
the story uh, unfortunately continues. So you have also to take into account this fact of having to introduce auxiliary fields, namely ghost fields of negative degree in order to be able need to perform this gauge fixing. Of course, you want to do that in a way that is not changing your cohomology. You still want to have a control on what is your BV cohomology. And I mean, it's nothing uh, uh, strange. So somehow it's already the ghost field, the ghost sector that is telling you how to perform this extension. So what plays a role is the so-called level of reducibility of your theory. And this is just, you know, somehow adding these extra steps. So uh, then at this point, you see that I have, have our diagrams uh, keep growing. So there is also this extra step of adding auxiliary fields, but doing that carefully so that the, what I call there the total complex is quasi isomorphic to the BV complex. So we are almost at the end because of course, uh, after introducing these auxiliary fields, uh, you are able to perform the gauge fixing procedure, which uh, consists in uh, somehow restricting your X tilde, S tilde. So actually your total theory. So remember that now we have also this extra uh, auxiliary fields to the Lagrangian sum manifold defined by the gauge fixing conditions. And of course, uh, all this uh, step need to be done carefully because you want that uh, the physical quantity that you are still computing are uh, independent on the ch uh, chosen gauge fixing. And then uh, here is where finally also the BRST cohomology entered the games because you can, uh, you can prove that uh, after performing the gauge fixing, there is still some residual symmetry that is captured by this uh, second cohomology complex, this BRST. And also this uh, complex is relevant because it still encodes, uh, for example, the classical observable of your initial theory. So somehow the whole story is summarized in this uh, big diagram. So you start with your initial gauge theory, you introduce ghost anti-ghost, and at that point you're able to construct the BV complex. And somehow intermediate step, you do have to introduce auxiliary fields. And also in this case, you have an induced uh, complex. And finally, you can perform the gauge fixing and introducing the BRST complex. So uh, that is what is, for me, this BV construction. So uh, now, of course, uh, the question is, can we uh, rephrase uh, this construction in terms of spectral triples? So let's, uh, uh, as I said, uh, super quickly say something about why it's uh, meaningful to wonder whether uh, the uh, non-commutative geometry can be a good setting for describing uh, the BV construction. So uh, as any field of mathematics, of course, we can try to present non-commutative geometry from very different perspectives. And of course, Walter told us about this uh, more spectral approach. And for me, let's say that I like to look at that as some let's say, generalization of classical differential geometry. So what do I mean? So somehow uh, the key idea uh, can be of the one of some let's say, try to translate geometrical object in algebraic terms and uh, see whether having this kind of uh, translation from classical geometry to algebra may allow to uh, consider more general objects. So uh, following this kind of uh, point of view, we could remember the Gelfand uh, duality that allows indeed to um, move from uh, locally compact house of spaces to commutative sister algebras. So somehow we do have that in this kind of translation, a basic object in a classical topology can be restated in algebraic terms. But the important part is what is there in red, namely it's commutative. So of course, once you are on the algebraic side, you might wonder if you can actually drop this commutativity condition and arrive into some kind of, let's say, non-commutative topological space that of course doesn't have any more any uh, geometric uh, uh, interpretation, but is uh, purely algebraic. And of course you can enrich all the structure and arrive into uh, the already uh, cited reconstruction theorem by Kahn, where indeed you have uh, this kind of duality this time reproduced between compact Riemannian spin manifold on one side and a canonical spectral triple, where actually you see there are extra elements, so this J and gamma appearing. But once again, you see that the underlying algebra is commutative and you may wonder, if this uh, condition can be dropped. And you arrive to the already uh, explained um, 
definition of spectral triple that therefore can be used as some kind of let's say non-commutative notion of manifold in this um, perspective so here i just quickly restate what is the definition of a spectral triple given by uh, an algebra an Hilbert space and uh, an operator d with compact resolvent and bounded uh, commutators However, a point that uh, um, is interesting to consider is that each time you're given a spectral triple, you can naturally define a gauge theory. So here is uh, the recipe, so how you can construct your configuration space, action functional, and gauge group given a, a spectral triple. Sorry, uh, here uh, possibly A should be embedded in B of H, yes, uh, not, uh, not equivalent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, I noticed it. Yes, so thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. So for the gauge theory, uh, the configuration space X0 is obtained as uh, that uh, um, collection of elements. So you do have, uh, you consider sums of product of an element J in the algebra times this uh, commutator with the operator D and you restrict it to the self-adjoint part, so where star is the star operation on your algebra. For what concerns the action functional, this is uh, taken to be the spectral action, so it's going to be the trace of, uh, I mean, I wrote there a polynomial because it's the kind of model I'm interested, of course you can consider a more general setting, uh, but uh, yes, so a trace uh, of this uh, function in D plus phi, so phi is again an element in the configuration space, and for what concern the um, gauge group is taken to be the unitary element of your algebra. So uh, with this kind of uh, a recipe given a spectral triple, you can uh, construct a gauge theory. And as already uh, Walter explained us, there are several models one can uh, recover with this kind of language. So here, just uh, quickly remind you that indeed the, the standard model can be seen in this uh, as an almost commutative spectral triple. Okay, so I think that that is um, very convincing. So that indeed the uh, non-commutative geometry can be an interesting framework for this uh, uh, construction. So what is the goal? Uh, so of course, we have noticed that, so the BVST, the BV complexes, somehow they are really encoding the physical theory and the physical um, properties we are interested in. So one might wonder, okay, can we actually use uh, this, uh, the fact that non-commutative geometry is somehow encoding gauge theory uh, to uh, describe a construction that is really involves gauge theory in terms of spectral triple? And also, can we say something for the cohomology, so for the BRST and the BV cohomology, and relate them to other cohomological theories uh, or, um, appearing uh, in the setting of non-commutative geometry? So, okay, so I should say that this is a, a project that started together with uh, Walter von Sonico, and uh, so you see, somehow we want to complete this uh, diagram. So underneath, you do have the BV construction, so with the first extension through ghost fields, and then auxiliary fields, and then the gauge fixed version. You do have the three cohomology complex appearing, so the BV complex is the first, the BRST is the last, and you might wonder, okay, because I can obtain a gauge theory starting from a spectral triple, can I actually completely lift all this construction? Uh, to the level of non-commutative geometry and somehow introducing a notion of BV spectral triple, total spectral triple, and some kind of gauge fixing fermion in this setting, so that uh, all these new spectral triples encodes what is under underneath, so this BV construction, and also gives the correct cohomology groups. So uh, when uh, we started this project, so we uh, faced the first error, so the first step for you two, and uh, that turned out to be pretty complicated, but not really for non-commutative geometry, but for the BV construction underneath in it. But uh, let's uh, tell, I, mean, I will tell you what, uh, uh, what we figured out. So the first question of, is, uh, can we make the first step? So can we uh, encode somehow the BV extended theory in a new object that we are going to call this BV spectral triple? So what we want to do is to complete that diagram. So uh, first of all, let's note two uh, characteristics that our um, BV extended theory has. 
So on one side, we do have the final spectral triple are, you know, somehow naturally defined over C. Uh, and on the other end, on S tilde, we do have Grassmannian variables appearing. So we do have these two characteristics that we have to take care of. So for the first one, somehow, this, let's say this idea of going from C to R can be handled by adding an extra element in your spectral triple, namely a real structure. So a real structure is just an antilinear isometry on your Hilbert space, such that if you uh, compose it twice, this is either plus or minus the identity, and it either commutes or anti-commutes with D. Uh, then uh, we actually ask other two, condi two conditions that I stated for completeness, but uh, uh, yeah, so it's, um, it's just remember this kind of uh, map uh, on your Hilbert space. And when you are given uh, this uh, spectral triple together with a real structure, what you do have is a real spectral triple. And uh, then uh, the KO dimension written there is this come on, I mean, let's say table coming out from the plus and minus sign that can appear indeed in the square of uh, J and in the commuting, anti-commuting with operator D. Um, okay, so problem two, the appearance of Grassmannian variables in your S tilde. So to deal with that, actually, uh, we, should, we should remember that in the setting of uh, spectral triples, we actually have two notions of action playing a role. So we already encountered uh, what is the spectral action. And uh, you see here, I just recall the definition in terms of a trace of uh, uh, a function of your operator. But then there is also the fermionic action that actually um, it's uh, take, I mean, it's, uh, it involves the inner product structure on your Hilbert space can be defined on a subset of it. And you can also impose that your gross, uh, variables are actually Grassmannian variables. So uh, in other words, we do have that the BB construction of the, at the level of spectral triples is taking your initial spectral triple to a real BV spectral triple. So you need also to introduce this real structure. But of course, the key question is how can we read inside the initial spectral triple? What is the ghost sector of your theory? And also how can we uh, go from our initial uh, pair? So this zero and this polynomial determining your spectral action to uh, the new extended action as tilde. So how can we read all this element directly on the initial spectral triple without having to do all the, you know, consultate resolution and what I described you earlier. So I will tell you what's the answer in, uh, um, you, on uh, an example, let's say that is the, the U2 case. So imagine that your uh, H0 is just C2. What you realize is that um, uh, the BV uh, construction at this level reflect on having to perform an extension of the Hilbert space. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, appearing of, uh, I mean, this, um, uh, so of uh, HBV being given by this direct sum is not uh, surprising you because remember the BV construction requires this symmetry ghost anti-ghost fields. So what's surprise, okay, it's um, how you determine what are the, uh, the ghosts you have to introduce. Remember, they are related to the symmetries of your action. So in this particular case, you just have three independent uh, symmetries between pairs of coordinate and one involving all three of them. So, and this is what allow you to conclude how the Hilbert space should be. So as you see, it's growing a lot. So it goes from just being C2 to be given by um, six copies of M to C. So uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I don't know whether it's visible, but uh, um, I'm also keeping track of somehow the ghost degree of uh, our variables. So I'm uh, adding this uh, degree is zero, one, and two, just to remember what are indeed the ghost degree, because remember, you, we still want to go to uh, the corresponding cohomology. And of course, as uh, already motivated, there is also a real structure appearing. Okay, uh, now the difficult part, how we do determine what is the operator uh, that gives the correct action. So here I'm just recalling you what we've discovered. So namely that uh, the um, action uh, SPV, so namely the difference between the extended action and our initial action. So the new elements we want to describe is the linear in the anti-fields, anti-ghost fields and quadratic in the ghost fields. So this is what allow, uh, again, in uh, this U2 model to describe the BV operator as given by this big matrix. 
Um, so, I mean, I'm, for example, just commenting on how uh, in uh, the first position over there, you get a zero. And that, for example, is a consequence of your action being linear in the um, anti-field. So because otherwise, if it was not zero over there, you would have like quadratic terms. But uh, this is just to say how these properties of your action are uh, somehow forcing you to have a um, specific structure on the, D, um, the operator uh, DBV. And to conclude, the algebra is just found as the algebra that would complete your uh, AS Hilbert space H, your operator D, and the real structure to uh, a, a spectral triple. And in this case, uh, you uh, can compute and realize that actually doesn't change anything from what was your initial model. So here I'm stating the result. Uh, so again, for uh, the model that I just described you, and you see how given your initial spectral triple, simply M2, C, C2, and D0, uh, you can uh, construct this uh, BV spectral triple that somehow encodes your extended theory. So a similar result uh, was obtained, uh, I, uh, we obtained it with Walter. So here is just a little bit of a shuffling because we also need to take care of the degree of your um, ghost field. So to be able to continue, because of course that was the first step. So how to construct a BV spectral triple, but that's not the final one. But before moving to the cohomology part, uh, let's just uh, uh, recall a few things. So, so somehow uh, you find out that the operator you need, so this uh, DBV, uh, and doesn't fully commute or anti-commutes with your real structure. And this is somehow due to the fact that you're dealing both with bosons and fermions. For the rest, uh, somehow we do see that uh, is the Hilbert space, HBV, that encodes the ghost and anti-ghost sector, and it keeps track of the ghost degree of your particles. And uh, DBV is what gives you the action, so the new extended action. So we already comment on what is the role of the real structure. And uh, once again, so somehow it seems that in this case, the algebra DBV is not playing a critical role. And if we do make a comparison on how you uh, obtain your initial spectral, from your initial spectral triple, the induced gauge theory is, and on the other side, how given a BV spectral triple, it encodes a BV extended theory, you really see that there are like the different role plays and I mean, the different elements in the spectral triples ended up um, playing different roles. Okay, so now, the next step. So what happens at the level of cohomology? So as I told you at the beginning, each time you're given a BV extended theory, it, uh, uh, it naturally induces a cohomology, so a BV cohomology complex. In order to be sure that what we are doing is actually meaningful, uh, we also um, should take care of the fact that given a BV spectral triple, it also naturally induces a cohomology complex. And all of that should also fit with the framework we uh, are considering, namely uh, non-commutative geometry. So how can we construct a complex uh, given our BV spectral triple and actually the complex that we want? So the idea is to look to what are the cohomology theory that naturally appears in non-commutative geometry. So here I'm somehow giving you uh, some kind of vocabulary in this perspective of looking to non-commutative geometry as some kind of extension of classical Riemannian differential geometry, where you see that indeed uh, we look at spectral triple as some kind of non-commutative uh, notion of manifold. So I'm not really commenting on how you make this dictionary. I just want to draw the attention on the fact that Hoshid and cyclic homology naturally appear in this setting. So one might wonder, okay, can we actually use one of these two complexes in our case? So here I just quickly, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So I wasn't really precise on this point, but uh, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so I just quickly recall how is the definition uh, for a graded algebra and uh, yeah, by model. So uh, the cochain are just given by uh, maps from uh, tensor products of your algebra B with values in M. 
And for what concerns the uh, co-boundary operator, uh, it's a uh, you see the first and the last terms that take care, I mean, are, depends on the left and the right action of your bimodule. And uh, in uh, the, I mean, the big sum, actually what plays a role is the, the product of your algebra. So the question is, uh, can we actually find an algebra with a proper, uh, I mean, uh, with a product structure and then a bimodule with the left and right action uh, such that uh, their Oshield uh, complex coincide with our BB complex? And uh, yeah, here um, just uh, briefly, so there is a small uh, detail. So uh, what uh, uh, the B3 formalism require is that you do have this uh, symmetry between ghost and uh, anti-ghost. So this is also what is going to actually fix what happens in degree minus one. So, but on the other end, there are uh, some uh, anti fields that somehow don't really play a role. For example, uh, if you think to our UN model, the U1 part, you do imagine that it's not really playing a role, so it doesn't have any symmetries inside. So what we will actually be able to recover from the BV spatial triple is what I call here the effective BV complex. So it's the nothing, I mean, fancy is just somehow don't consider the anti-fields that are not really detecting uh, any symmetry. But of course, so you can still, you know, given this your effective part going back to the BV complex. So as I said, so it's just to be precise, but it's not that you're losing information somehow. So can we uh, find the correct algebra and the correct uh, bimodule? So here, uh, this is uh, the answer again for this U2 model. So you can find an algebra B is just, uh, of course, uh, given not surprisingly by your ghost and anti-ghost sector. So what uh, again plays a role is your Hilbert space. And for what concerns the product, this is coming from uh, the fermionic action of your BB spectral triple in all degrees, but in R0. And for what concerns the bimodule, this is actually coming from your initial fields. So it was already actually encoded in your initial spectral triple. And for what concern the ref, left and right um, structure, model structure, is coming from the, um, the fermionic action, this time in degree zero. So somehow schematically, we do have that given the BB spectral triple, the way how you construct uh, the corresponding um, pair of algebra and by module is as following. So somehow the algebra B is coming from your uh, um, Hilbert space and the by module is coming from your algebra while uh, the uh, operator DBV and the real structure that together gives you the uh, fermionic action are the one responsible in uh, degree zero for describing left and right action of your bimodule and in all the other degrees are related to the product structure on your algebra. So somehow it's telling that also the next step works. So we know how to go from MBV spectral triple to this uh, complex and actually this complex is what we want. So uh, the uh, Hochschild complex defined in this way coincide. So it's, uh, I mean, it's quasi isomorphic to the BV complex, this effective part. So of course, uh, this is not the end of the story, as we know. So we still have to take care of this technical step of introducing auxiliary fields. So we were wondering, okay, can we actually go from a BV spectral triple to another spectral triple that contains also these auxiliary fields? And here I'm once again reporting you what is the answer for this uh, uh, model that we have been considering. So this uh, U2 model and uh, um, you see that this, we have a similar structure. So once again, what really gets bigger and bigger is the Hilbert space. Nothing happened at the level of the algebra and the operator, we don't expect that to be anything fancy. So we are just adding auxiliary terms that don't want, we don't want to change the cohomology underneath. So we're dealing with contractible pairs. So we are just uh, making the metrics a bit bigger and putting identities here and there. But the crucial thing is that this gives again a spectral triple that has again a similar structure with respect to the BV spectral triple. So we can construct the corresponding, let's say, total theory. So this uh, uh, extended theory with also auxiliary fields. 
and uh, we are able to recover the, all the structure already from the BB spectral triple. So all the information are already considered over there to translate to the total one. And of course, uh, um, also this new big spectral triple uh, in this uh, cohomology. And this is uh, again, um, quite isomorphic to the one that we are interested in. So maybe the diagram will help. So this is where we are now. So I hope it helps. <laughs> so you see that we started with our initial uh, spectral triple. We can construct the associated gauge theory, but also we can also make the, uh, all the process uh, above, so the, in the first line. So we can actually uh, go from the initial spectral triple to the BV one and to the total one. And the construction is coherent in the sense that um, I told you how given the BV spectral triple, you can construct this pair um, of algebra and bimodule. You can ap actually apply the same process on the other side. So you can do exactly the same game for your total spectral triple. And having this time what I denoted by BT and uh, MT, also this uh, pair in this uh, uh, complex, and this is exactly what you want. So in some other word, let's say that this is all coherent and consistent. Uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, was just uh, the, not the last step yet, but we're almost there. So we have also to take care of uh, the gauge fixing procedure and of the BRST complex in this setting. And uh, one can uh, see that actually also this, also this fits well in the sense that you can somehow perform the gauge fixing procedure at the level of your algebra and your bimodule. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, what you ended up having is again a, a Hochschild complex, uh, this time encoding your BRST cohomology. So uh, we are arriving towards the end because uh, uh, this is what we ended up constructing. So we completed the diagram, as you see. So we managed to find the, what were the uh, argument to complete the, the first line. Um, and uh, yeah, so somehow you can actually lift the construction. And uh, as I told you, what was what is really difficult is uh, to uh, go from, I mean, to make the first step. So to go from your initial gauge theory to your BV extended one. So here, uh, at, at, at that point, uh, we still have to actually work with some other classes of uh, uh, actions, but um, uh, there is hope that all this will get complete. And of course, once this is done, one might wonder what's next. So um, of course, uh, then one might wonder, okay, this was the finite case. So you were considering finite spectral triple that uh, as Walter already told us, they're of course definitely interesting for non-commutative geometry, but what happens if we do, for example, consider the almost commutative case, how is that going to uh, uh, somehow uh, adding new symmetries and reflecting in the kind of ghost that we need to introduce? And another thing is that uh, actually what we were doing was just considering the classical BB formalism. Uh, of course, one can wonder what happens if we do go quantum. So namely, if we do uh, ask our um, action to not be solution of the classical master equation, but actually to solve the quantum master equation. Uh, at that point, uh, what changes actually, as I said, so the action, so you still have the same kind of ghost sector. So you do expect that uh, at the point, the Hilbert space is going to be the same because you know the Hilbert space is what was uh, encoding the ghost sector. But uh, of course, I mean, uh, we do expect that things will get more complicated for uh, the operator. So yeah, I think that, uh, as I said, so this is uh, for the future, but, uh, yeah, so for now, we'll just stop and thanks all of you for the attention. Okay, we still have time, but it's fine. We are back to our original schedule. So there are questions or comments. I have a few uh, questions, if I may. Do you hear me? Or? So I was wondering um, about this, uh, this, this B. So the star product that you introduce on B, which is very, looks very nice. So uh, this is a great step, of course. Um, 
and you define it using the brackets. So, uh, in, as well as the inner product on the Hilbert space. So I was wondering um, what makes that product associative, and if so, if there's a relation with the kind of deformation of Gerstenhaber. Ooh. Okay, so that uh, uh, I I don't know actually I haven't checked uh, uh, that part yet. So uh, somehow it was really you know knowing what we need to get or how it should actually uh, work. Uh, this um, uh, so yeah, I mean how it, it should be uh, you know, yes indeed working at the level of uh, the model. So is somehow. Uh, reconstructing from that so of course the uh, the fact that really the this the fermionic action is uh, your uh, bv action is somehow forcing to to have that uh, term of appearing but i don't know whether there is like a more elegant way of uh, describing that for now is it associative uh yeah it should be working uh, okay. i think and the example you gave, which was for two by two, I mean, this, uh, since the diagram here is depicted for n by n, this is this all works uh, through in the n by n case? Yeah, I mean, uh, going from two to n, uh, so the problem is really just for determining what is the, uh, your um, explicitly, what is uh, the def definition of the extended uh, action functional. But once you assume that you can construct this uh, triple, and this is expected because you do expect uh, a still to be linear in the anti-fields and anti ghosts so, so all of that should be uh, go uh, going uh, through. The problem was really like having an explicit description of the operator in uh, the uh, higher dimensional case, but just for, I mean, because it's difficult to handle, but it's expected to work. Okay, very good, very nice. Thanks a lot for this. Thanks. Then we continue with a question from the lecturer. I want to ask, um, what is the connection of if instead of the BV you have BFE, uh, BFV? What do you have in the spectral triple uh, elements that is corresponding to that? I'm sorry, I couldn't really instead hear of your the, question. Instead of the BV, if you have the BFV, so what would be change in your uh, Oh, from BV to tribal. BFB. Um, yeah, so this is uh, still to be done. So I, I don't know how that would even be. Even in the first step, even for corresponding between the spectral tripod, you don't know that? Yeah, I mean, in fairness, the difficult part is really the first step. <laughs> so as I try to uh, explain, because uh, it's uh, really, you know, finding the sector and the solution of the classical master equation on a I mean, a general model can be complicated. So, uh, yeah, so actually, if you handle the first step, probably you can handle the rest. So, this is why, I mean, uh, I haven't checked that for. Uh, but do you have any idea which, which of the three elements, which of them would be changed? I mean, what, sorry? which term would be changed if when you go to BFE? Uh, yeah, I mean, as I said, so somehow it seems that the Edward space is the one uh, for the ghost sector. And uh, the action is encoded in the pair operator real structure. So, um, yeah, okay. I mean, probably not the algebra. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, other questions or comments? I have a question, if I may. Um, thank you for the nice talk. It's really impressive to see the, uh, the whole DRST. Uh, machinery to work, uh, to live to the milk with case for the UN uh, case. And I'm wondering about the uh, SUN case, because in uh, non commutative geometry, as far as I understand it, uh, this step is usually uh, done by some imposing some unimodularity condition. Uh, so I'm wondering, yeah, what's the problem here? Uh, is it in the first step already when you try to go to the BV spectral triple or is the problem somewhere else? So, I, yes. Okay, so you're asking uh, uh, SUN instead of UN. Yes. Did I, okay. So, um, maybe, uh, so the model I've been showing you was this uh, U2 model. And uh, I didn't really explain how you were 
actually going from uh, you know two by two self adjoint matrices to the action I showed you. But uh, somehow well, you were seeing this kind of symmetry between, let's say, x1, x2, and x3. So that was uh, the U2, uh, SU2 part uh, uh, somehow represented in the symmetry of your action. So then the U1 component appearing was uh, naturally not really entering the symmetry. So uh, at least uh, in, at that level, so you, there was not such a um, uh, I mean, uh, the presence of this extra U1 part, it was uh, actually what was creating this, let's say, technical problem of having to get a little bit uh, to this, let's say, effective BB complex. So actually, I think that if you consider uh, SUN, you might actually have, a, I mean, a clear like, construction without having to somehow pass to the effective part. So it might be that uh, that is uh, actually even nicer to to, to tell as a story, so it uh, it fits probably better. You're right. Well, that uh, that would be very impressive. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions or comments? Then let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>